good morning. It's good to see you today. I am Daniel. I'm the discipleship pastor here at FBC Bernie. And this morning, we are beginning a brand new series that's connected to the series that we've been in, okay? So if that's not confusing, I'll I'll try to, if it is confusing, I'll try to clear that up as we go along. But we have been spending several weeks now looking at the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and his indwelling presence in us. And last week, Pastor Jason went to the book of Galatians and he helped us see that in Galatians, the church there had a tendency that we have. And that is to run back to the law rather than relying on the grace of God. In other words, they would say, if it takes the grace of God for me to be saved, but I need to, in my flesh, keep myself saved. And so they would constantly run back to the flesh. And we saw that Paul told the Galatians, he said, who has bewitched you? Why did you start with Christ, but now you think you have the ability to keep yourself saved? He said, that is not the gospel. He said, that is another message, but it is not the true gospel. And so we saw that the only way for us to walk out our faith is in the power of the Holy Spirit. So here's here's the reality for us, is that every follower of Christ For each and every one of us today, if you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, here is something you need to know today. Your flesh is constantly at war with the Spirit. We have every day, many times a day, constantly throughout the day, the choice to make of whether we are gonna walk in the power of the Spirit or whether we are gonna try to do it in our own flesh. But here is what I want us to see. Over the last six weeks, we've been talking about a reality for all of us as followers of Jesus Christ, and that is that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, dwells in us. And we've seen what Jesus said to be true, that it is better for us that he went away, because when he went away, it meant now that the Spirit of the Holy Spirit himself now resides and dwells in us. And it says we can do even greater things because of that reality. So we've been looking at that reality of the indwelling spirit, but here's what we're gonna look at for the next nine weeks. We're gonna look at how to appropriate that. Because you can have the reality that the spirit indwells you is a good thing, but if you don't apply it to your life, if you don't walk it out, it's not going to be advantageous to you. You are not going to see the victory that is yours to live the life that God has called you to live, that he has saved you for. You are gonna miss out on that when you try to accomplish it in your own flesh. It is only when we appropriate the spirit of God and his power in our lives that we will see the victory. And so as we begin today, I want us to read our text for the next nine weeks. So look up here on the screen. We're gonna put up here a passage of scripture that's probably very familiar to you in Galatians chapter five, verses 22 and 23. Would you read this out loud with me? But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And against such things, there is no law. Amen. So a few things as we set up this series, as you came in this morning, hold this up if you got one. Did you get your booklet? If you did not, make sure on your way out today, you pick one of these up. This is for everyone. This is a guide, whether as an individual, whether as a couple, whether as a family, if you've got young children, if you've got teenage children, no matter who you are, this will be a great supplement for you for the next nine weeks as we journey through the fruit of the Spirit to just spend more time letting the Spirit help you apply 
these truths to your life. There's great suggestions in here for how to do that. So take this and use it this summer. In the busyness of the summer, this will be a great thing for you to be able to circle up together as families, as couples, and even as an individual, for you to be able to say, let me continue to meditate on what we will be looking at together in our worship services throughout the summer. There's suggestions, couples, for date nights and how you can talk about these truths even on a date. Parents, how you can have conversations with your children about the fruit of the Spirit. So many things, please take this and use this. This will be a great tool for you this summer. Parents of children, there's another resource that we want you to pick up in the connection tent on your way out the door. You need to get one of these per child. This is a cool chart. If you have young children, this is like better than Elf on the Shelf, okay? Um, Y'all know what Elf on the Shelf is, right? Okay, just making sure you're with me. This is a fruit of the spirit chart. And so here's what's in here. There are stickers in here. There's a chart in here for every child. It is for you to hang up, put somewhere very visible in your home. And every time you see your child demonstrating the fruit of the spirit, they get a sticker to put on their chart. What a cool thing to use to keep this passage of scripture in front of our children to help disciple them this summer. So grab one of these per child on your way out today, okay? Does that sound good? As we journey through this together, excellent. All right, so let's jump into the series. And the way I wanna start this morning is by looking at the first six words in Galatians chapter five, verse 22. So let's throw those words up on the screen and look at what it says. But the fruit of the Spirit is. Now let's let's make sure we have a good grasp of these words before we move into the first thing it tells us that the fruit of the Spirit is. First of all, this word but, this serves as a transition word. In other words, Paul is saying this, what I'm getting ready to tell you stands in direct opposition to what I have just talked about. So I'm sure you're asking, well, Daniel, what did Paul just talk about? I'm glad you asked. Let's look at it for just a minute. So in chapter five, verses 19 through 21, let's look at what Paul says. He says, now the work of the flesh. So there's our first clue. In verse 22, he says, the work of the Spirit is, and he tells us, prior to that, he's talking about what the flesh produces. Again, this war between the Spirit and the flesh. He says, now the work of the Spirit, the work of the flesh, excuse me, they are evident, and he lists them. And man, what a list. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, Fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. He says, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul's painting a pretty clear picture here, is he not? He says, you think your flesh has any merit that in your flesh you can somehow keep yourself saved. He said, listen, let me tell you what the flesh produces, the fruit of the flesh. It stands in direct opposition to the work of the Spirit in you. He says, don't put confidence in the flesh. Put confidence in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. So he says, but the fruit of the Spirit. And that word actually has a great amount of victory for us as children of God. Here's what it means. That the Spirit triumphs over the flesh. Isn't that good news? That for each and every one of us, we don't have to wonder, can we overcome sin and temptation in our life? The truth of the word of God, the truth of the gospel is that there is victory for us when we appropriate the Spirit's power in our lives. So he says, listen, but, that's a great word, the fruit. Let's look at what he means here. Why would he use fruit for the picture? As he's getting ready to talk about the work of the Holy Spirit, why fruit? Well, I think there's a few reasons why he might use fruit. Here's the first one of those. Fruit comes from something that's living. 
You don't get fruit from a dead tree. You don't get fruit from a dead vine or, or, or a bush or a plant, do you? Fruit only comes from something that is living. The gospel tells us that the life we have, we have been crucified with Christ as followers of Jesus Christ. And it says the life we live now, we live by the spirit, by the power of the spirit. We have new life. And Paul says, listen, what the spirit does in you, it's like fruit. You will only produce fruit when you have the life of the spirit dwelling in you and you are walking in that spirit. So fruit, it, per, it is only produced when there is life. But also when we look at fruit, fruit requires growth. If you plant an apple tree and that tree grows and at the very beginning, are there apples immediately on that tree? Or do they have to ripen? Do they have to grow? Any fruit tree, right? Any vine, any bush, the fruit doesn't start out fully mature, does it? It grows over time to where it's fully ripe and ready to be picked and enjoyed. Child of God, can I encourage you this morning? This is gonna kind of feel, this is gonna be difficult this morning. There's gonna be moments where you feel like, ouch, quit stepping on my toes. But here is a moment where you can be very encouraged to know that the, the spirit who will develop these characteristics that we're gonna see for the next nine weeks in you. It is not in your strength that they will be accomplished. So if you look at your life and you look at this fruit of the spirit in Galatians 5 and you say, man, I've got some work to do. Guess what? That's okay. Yield to the spirit's power and let him work through you, let him work in you. It is a process. It is a sanctification process for that fruit to be developed in you. One more reason why I believe Paul uses the word fruit here is that it requires care. When you plant a fruit tree, you don't just plant it and leave it. You got, you got a weed around it to keep the weeds from choking out the life. You've got you've to make sure it has water and sunlight. It's got to be pruned from time to time. And it's got to be harvested. It requires constant care. It's a great lesson for us. It's a great thing for us to keep in mind as we look at these, is that they are not going to happen without intentionality on our part. We are not going to display the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. We're not going to demonstrate it by accident. It's going to be a conscious effort on our part to yield and surrender to the power of the Holy Spirit working in us and then working through us if we want to exhibit these characteristics in our life. But the fruit of the last word I wanna draw your attention to, Spirit. This tells us who the fruit belongs to. Scripture says that our righteousness is as filthy rags. It's not our fruit. It is the work of the Holy Spirit. He produces the fruit. It's his fruit that is demonstrated in our lives. It's just another reminder that points us back to the fact that we can do nothing apart from the work of the Spirit working in us and working through us. But the fruit of the Spirit. Why not fruits, plural? Why didn't Paul say, but the fruits of the Spirit? Because there's a whole list of them, right? I'm glad you asked that question too. You guys are on top of it today. You're perceptive. I love that you're asking such good questions. Why would he not say fruit? Because it's singular in nature. Because all of these attributes, all of these characteristics come from the same source. They come from the work of the Holy Spirit that's indwelling us. Here's another reason. You can't pick and choose which of them you want to demonstrate. You can't say, okay, I'll take the love, 
but I hate this patience one, so I'm gonna let somebody else pick up patience and I'm gonna let them display that, right? I'm gonna do the joy, let somebody else handle the self-control. No, they are all collectively the work of the indwelling spirit and they all need to be manifested in our lives. We don't get to pick and choose which ones we express. And here's the other reason. Walking in the spirit means that each of these expressions of the Spirit are growing in our lives. In other words, as you walk with Jesus, this time next year, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, they all should be more evident in your life a year from now than they are today if the indwelling Spirit is doing his work in you. It is all the work of the Spirit. So as we go through this series, it'll be very helpful for us each week to approach it by saying this. How is the fruit of the Spirit expressed in love being demonstrated in my life? Or next week, how is the fruit of the Spirit expressed in joy being displayed in my life? And so on and so on. So this morning, we're gonna tackle love. We're gonna look at the fruit of the Spirit is love. It's first in the list because it's the catalyst for all of the others. It's the motivation for all of the others. They all flow out of love. And we're gonna see why in just a few minutes. But before we do, we've gotta stop and think about this word, the word love. It's probably the most used word in the English language, is it not? I mean, when we think about love, it is the most used. And I wanna show you why. I mean, where would theater and art and music be without love? I'm gonna let you help me fill in the blanks on a few things here. Help me out with this here. What are those words? What go in that sentence? What's love got to do with it? Good job, all right? Next one. All All you need is love. All right, very good. One more for you. You gotta do it with the the accent, right? Wav, twu, wav, right? (laughs) Great movie. Love, It's, it's, it's the theme of everything. But here's the danger. Here's the danger. With so, with love being taken by our culture, It has been defined and redefined and redefined and redefined to where it has become distorted. So if we're really gonna understand what it means for the fruit of the Spirit to express itself in love, we've got to do two things. We've gotta understand how Scripture defines it and how Christ models it, amen? So how scripture defines love. There's so many places we could turn to to look at how scripture defines love, but I wanna draw your attention to a passage that I think is so clear for us to see, and that is in 1 John chapter four. Let me read for you. We're gonna put it up on the screen, verses nine and 10. It says, in this, the love of God was made manifest among us. It was shown to us, it was made visible to us in this way that God sent his only son into the world that we might live through him. In him, that we might live through him. Verse 10, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin. Two things that jump out of this passage to us as we go through it. Number one, God's love was displayed to us. We understand love through this one thing. God sent his son so that we could have life. That is the definition according to scripture of what love is. And the second thing we see in verse 10 is that God's love sets the standard for love. We could say it this way, love originates with God. Love does not originate in us. In other words, as mankind, as human beings, we don't get the option to define love because love is not ours. Love is God, he defines it. 
And he defines it as the, the qualities, what he did that caused him to send his son to take our place, to be the propitiation, the satisfaction, the atonement, the substitute for our sin. God says, listen, you wanna know what love is? That's love. That is the definition. So any way that we want to express love, it's gotta be compatible with that because God defines it because it's who he is. Did you know the whole Bible is defining love for us? The entirety of God's word in dramatic fashion is communicating to us that God is, is love and his work of love is shown all through scripture. In like two minutes, let's think about what we know about the Bible and connect the dots and see how that is true. In Genesis chapter one, we see a triune God in, in the love that they have in themselves expressing it through the creation of the world. And in that creation of the world, the pinnacle of the creation, mankind, man and woman, were made in God's image so that he could have fellowship, perfect fellowship with his creation. It was an act of love. But then man in Genesis chapter three chose to sin. But in Genesis 3.15, we see God say in the first mention of the gospel in all of scripture, we see God make a promise that even though man sinned and broke that fellowship with God, he says, I will defeat sin. I will crush sin. I have a plan that is working in you. But the wickedness worsens as we go through scripture. And so now we come to, to Noah and we see in Noah, God says, Noah is a righteous man. So I'm gonna save his family. I'm gonna take them into the ark and I'm gonna save them. And I'm gonna start again, start fresh with humanity through the line of Noah. And so after the flood, Noah comes out of the ark. And so righteous Noah, can he live and have fellowship with God? And we see Noah at the end of his life, drunk and naked, sinning in a garden, just like Adam and Eve. But then we move on and the wickedness worsens again and we get to the Tower of Babel or Babylon and we see man's attempt to dethrone God. And then we move on and we, Genesis switches and we get to chapter 12 and we see the story now of one man that God chose to say, Abraham, I'm gonna make you the father of many nations and it is through you that all the kingdoms of the earth will be blessed. It had nothing to do with Abraham. It wasn't his righteousness. Abraham had plenty of flaws of his own. But God says, I am going to do something through you. But now this family line of Abraham, it ends up in slavery in Egypt. But then God comes and through Moses, he delivers his people from slavery and from bondage. And he leads them to the promised land. But they get to the promised land and they continue in their wickedness. And God has to send judges to deliver the people time and time again. But what we see as we go through is that none of them could completely and ultimately do what the people needed to bring rescue and redemption. They would continue to sin. And so the people cry out for a king, that we need a king and that will fix our problems. But we see the kingly line in Israel, it just continues to get worse and worse and worse until finally God's people end up back in Babylon, but not this time dethroning God, this time in slavery because of their sin. But then, John the Baptist, baptizing in the Jordan River, looks up and he sees Jesus walking to him and he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The story of scripture, God is faithful, even in our unfaithfulness, he is faithful to demonstrate his love and to do what is necessary for us to understand and recognize our sin and turn to him. Church, this is the story. This is the theme of scripture, God's love story to you and to I. His work of redemption is that story. Now this morning, we have a chance to not just see how scripture defines it, but as we look at how Christ models it, 
we get to do this in a special way this morning. We get to come around the Lord's table and partake of communion. And so our deacons are gonna be in the aisles right now. If you did not get the elements for the Lord's Supper as you walked in today, just slip your hand up and they'll make sure that you have these. Let me tell you while they're doing this, this is open for you to participate with us in the Lord's Supper if you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. If you have not taken that step, then this is not for you yet. Today, your step, your act of worship is to fall on your knees before Jesus Christ and confess your sins, acknowledge your need for him and submit yourself to him as king of your life and accept what he did through these elements as your salvation, as your atonement for sin. But for those of us in this room today who are followers of Jesus, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 26, that is often as we take these elements, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So church this morning, I wanna invite you to take the bread And as you take the bread, we've seen how scripture defines love. Pause for a moment and look at how Christ models it. Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, scripture says, took bread. And it says, and when he had broken it, he gave thanks for it. And he said, this is my body that was broken for you. As Mark said earlier this morning, this was God's plan since before the foundation of the world, that Jesus would bear himself the weight of our sin, that he would be bruised, that by his stripes we would be healed. Amen. God, as we pause this morning, acknowledging God, just being overwhelmed by your love for us that you displayed throughout history that culminated in your son going to the cross, his body being pierced and bruised and beaten for us. God, we are reminded that no greater love has ever been displayed. This is love, that Christ laid down his life for us. So Lord Jesus, this morning, in obedience to your command, we remember your death as we take this bread. In Jesus' name, would you take the bread with me? First Corinthians chapter 11 also goes on to say in verse 25, in the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Throughout Israel's history, sacrifice had to be made to atone for sin. Blood had to be shed and spilled in order for sin to be atoned for. Jesus took that cup and he said, no longer will the blood of bulls and goats be necessary for the cleansing, for the atonement of your sin. He said, but my blood will be spilled so that you can be forgiven, so that you can be adopted into my family. No greater love, no greater love. Amen, church. Father, we thank you this morning for this cup. This cup of redemption, this cup that Jesus willingly drunk. He bore your wrath so that we could be redeemed. So this morning, as we pause to take this cup, I pray that we would be reminded anew and afresh of what we sang this morning, how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that he would give his only son to make this wretch his treasure. 
Hallelujah, Lord Jesus, we thank you for your blood as we take it this morning. So we've, we've examined scripture to see how scripture defines love in a very reverent and worshipful way. We have been reminded of how Christ modeled love. He models love all through the gospels, but in the greatest display of love, we have gotten to participate in the Lord's table and see how he modeled love. I wanna spend just a few minutes this morning, in the last little bit of time we have remaining, thinking about how that love should be expressed and visible in our lives. We've already read in 1 John chapter 4 that love is defined as God's work of salvation. So here's our starting place. If you, what you define as love, if it is not compatible with the gospel, then it's not genuine love. If we're gonna submit to scripture, if we're gonna submit to the authority of God's word, then we, that has to be our starting place. We don't get to define it. God defined it because it's who he is. And he says that if what we call love is not compatible with what we see in the gospel, then it's not genuine love. So what do we know from the gospel about love? What are some qualities of love that we see displayed in the work of the gospel? First one, you can't love and disregard the truth. You see, that's a lie in our culture that we have to set aside truth and righteousness and holiness in order to love, that those two things are, ex are mutually exclusive and they're not. They're two sides to the same thing. They're both characteristics of God. God's love was not his disregard for righteousness, his disregard for holiness and truth. No, it was taking the punishment of our sin upon himself so that we could be redeemed. So don't think that in order to love, we have to disregard the truth. That's not what the gospel says about love. Our culture believes a couple of lies. The first one is that if you disagree with someone, then you must fear them or you must hate them. The second one is that to love someone means you have to agree with them and believe everything that they say or do. Church, both of those things are nonsense. Nowhere in scripture do we get that definition of love. The Bible says that while we were enemies of God, Christ died for us. Love is not about agreement. The love of God says, even in your sin, I'm gonna show up. Another thing that we see from the gospel about love is that love is costly to the giver. It costs God, his only son, his only begotten son. The wrath of God was poured out on his son in the greatest display of love. Another thing we learn from the gospel about love is that love moves toward the recipient and love moves first. Church, may we be a people that move towards those that we disagree with, that we move towards those who, who believe and are adamantly supportive of everything that we know is against scripture. May we be the ones who move toward them with the message of the gospel, demonstrating the love of God to them. And may we move first. Amen. We have the message of life change, of redemption. If we are going to express the fruit of the Spirit as it is shown in love, then we've got to move first towards those who need to receive the gospel. 
Another thing about love that we learn from the gospel is that love is not dependent upon whether the recipient deserves it. If it was, what a mess we would be in, amen? It was while we were sinners that Christ died for us. That's why Paul said it is a false gospel to think that somehow you've got to clean yourself up to get to God. We can't clean ourselves up to get to him. He, he came, stepped into it, took our sin upon himself. It's messy. If we're going to model the love of God as seen in the gospel, we've got to be willing to step into the mess. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Another thing that we understand about love from the gospel is that the giver of love is not motivated by personal need or agenda. The Lord Jesus did not go to the cross in order for us to have fellowship with the Father because God was lacking something and he needed us. God has everything he needs within himself. No, he went to the cross because of what we needed. Love is not motivated by personal need or agenda. We don't love in order to get something. If we're truly gonna love the way scripture defines love, it is by saying, I'm gonna step in to someone's life. And I'm gonna express the love of God to them whether I get anything in return or not. True love is never motivated by personal need or agenda. I don't know about you, but as I look at these things on this list, I am convinced of one thing for sure. Is that it, that is this, that the love that is shown to us through the gospel, it is impossible for us to demonstrate that kind of love without the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm incapable of it. In my flesh, I am selfish. In my flesh, I am maybe willing to step in and do something for you, but deep down, it's because one day I know I'm gonna need something and I want you to be there for me. I'm motivated by agenda and need. I'm motivated a lot of times by whether I like you or not. I'm just being honest, right? If we're all being honest with ourselves, it's easy to love people that we like. It's easy to love people who are like us and who agree with us. Right, if you're an Alabama fan, it's hard for me to love you. I have to pray really hard to love you. Right, it's easy when there's agreement. It's easy when there's similarities. Ah, oh, but it gets tough when everything about you stands in opposition to everything that I hold dear. That takes supernatural love. And that is only possible through the indwelling Holy Spirit. So how do we apply this? Every time we come to the word of God, if we don't stop and say, how does this play out in my life? What am I to do with this as I walk out of these doors? Then we're, we're stopping short of what God wants to say and do through his word. So this morning, Let me ask you this. Think about your relationships. Let's, let's look at our relationships through the lens of love. Love is defined in the gospel. What is the culture of your relationships? Do they reflect love? But let's say it this way. Do they reflect the gospel? Men with your wives, the culture of that relationship, does it reflect genuine love as we see demonstrated through the gospel? 
Do we love our wives that way? Wives, do you love your husbands that way? Teenagers, do you love your parents that way? Do you love your siblings that way? Uh Uh-oh, I said we're gonna step on toes, right? Parents, do we love our kids that way? I can tell you one of the lies in our culture, and I'll try not to get off on a rabbit trail, but one of the lies in our culture is that parents, we think that it's most important that our kids like us and that if they like us, that means they love us and that we've got this relationship. Can I tell you, sometimes that's the most unloving thing we can do is to try to make our kids happy and make sure they like us. No, what our kids need is the truth of God's word instilled in them. And sometimes what they need more than anything is to see there are boundaries and there are consequences and that we are called to be their parents first and their friends second. So how do you love your children? Are you displaying true gospel-centered love to your kids? Or are you showing them a counterfeit that is gonna leave them lacking in what they need as they grow into adulthood? What about with your neighbors? Maybe you have neighbors who come election time, they put signs out in your yard that just make you wanna vomit because it's the opposite of who you vote for. Do you still love them? Are you still gonna show Christ to them? Evaluate your relationships through this lens of love that can only be demonstrated through the power of the Spirit. Another thing to think about, where have you settled in your life for a counterfeit version of love. And as you think about that, I'm gonna ask our band and our worship team to go ahead and make their way on out because as we examine these last two things, I just want you to do business with God. I want you to pause. I want you to block out any distractions that might be around you. And I want you to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you through this. How have you settled for counterfeit versions of love? Our culture says things like, love wins. Well, there is some truth in that. The love of Jesus Christ does win. He has victory over sin. But our culture likes to take a little bit of truth and mix it with a lie. And as C.S. Lewis says, it makes the lie that much stronger when that happens. Believers, we have got to go to the word of God and we've got to make sure that what we call love passes the test of scripture. Are you settling for counterfeits, versions of love? Are you chasing after relationships because you believe you complete me? We are not complete through any human relationship. It is only through a relationship with holy God, and that is only accomplished through Jesus Christ. And finally, when it comes to bearing the fruit of the Spirit expressed in love, where are you still resistant to the Spirit in your life? And what needs to change in order for you to walk in the Spirit's power? Can we think about that one? Can we take that question to the Lord as our team begins to lead, as we sing this final song? I wanna invite you to do business with God and I can't tell you what that looks like. I can just urge you to respond to the Spirit's leading in your life. Do you need to make Jesus your Lord and Savior? Is he, are you still on the throne of your life and does he need to be your king? You come. We have counselors, we have ministers here who would love to walk with you and help you understand how you could trust Jesus. Maybe you need to use these steps as an altar and you just need to confess areas where you've settled for a counterfeit version of love and you need to fall down on your knees and cry out and say, God, I need your help to walk in the spirit and show love the way that you demonstrated love to me. I need to express that to others. We'll have ministers here to pray with you if you wanna pray with someone or if you wanna pray by yourself.
but would you be obedient to the Spirit's prompting as we sing? God, take your word and use it, I pray this morning. Do a deep work in our hearts that we might better express your love to those around us in Jesus' name.